Well, good evening, my friends, and welcome to another Wednesday edition of the virtual Bible study with the New Hope Baptist Church here in Covington, Georgia. We thank God for all of you sharing with us, and we pray God's blessings upon you. Hope you had a great day. I had a good day, a real good day, and I thank God for it. Well, listen, today is Wednesday. It's another Wednesday. It is September 21st. Wow, this year is going by so fast. It's September already. September 21st, 2022. And we just thank God for another day's journey. As far as our prayer concerns tonight, we are praying for our own brother Reuben Dunn. Uh, some of you may or may not know, uh, Ruben's mom died. Her mother, his mother died in the person of uh, Mother Carol Warren. She died Sunday afternoon at the uh, Riverside Health Care Center here in Covington. And uh, memorial services are scheduled for next Wednesday. That's next Wednesday. I believe that date will be uh, September the 28th, next Wednesday at 11 a.m. at the church. So we certainly want to be lifting Reuben up in our prayers. We also praying uh, for Sister Brenda Clark. I understand she's at home now, uh, recuperating from uh, a stay in the hospital. And so we're lifting up Brenda in our prayers. We're also lifting up, as always, our nation, our world, and there are just so many situations uh, around that um, solicit and crave our prayers. If there ever was a time when the people of God need to be praying, and surely that time is right now. And speaking of prayer, we just want to remind you of our Thursday night prayer line. Yes, the Thursday night prayer line. That'll be tomorrow at 8 um, p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's from 8 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the number to call is 774-220-4020. Again, that's 774-220-4020. Access code, once you call, is 372-1137 followed by the pound sign. Again, we're praying tonight for uh, Sister Brenda Clark. We're praying for Brother Reuben Dunn in the passing of his mother. We're lifting up uh, Sister Doretha and um, Brother Moses Muncrief. We're praying for Mother um, Florine Wilburn, Mother um, Betty Mathis Jackson, and Mother Lane, and we're praying for all of those who stand in the need of prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll be coming forth with our lesson for tonight. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you again for this privilege and this opportunity uh, for just to uh, enjoy another beautiful day. We thank you for your grace, and we thank you for your mercy. We thank you, God, for your love for keeping us. And Father, now as we come forth for another Bible study, we lift up uh, those who are in dire situations. We lift up the people of Puerto Rico. I understand just had another hurricane in that area. Five years to the day uh, when Hurricane Maria struck uh, five years ago. And so they need you, We're lifting them up. We're lifting up our own sister Brenda. We're lifting up uh, our own uh, Sister Doretha and Brother Moses and Mother Jackson and Mother Lang and Mother 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 Wilburn. Lift up Reuben Duncan, our own Reuben Duncan, Reuben Dunn, I'm sorry. Lift up Reuben Dunn, Father, as he deals with the transition of his mother. We just pray God you just comfort him and strengthen him, uh, sustain him through this period uh, as uh, only you can. Father, we know you're able. And continue to be with us, lead us and guide us. Give us now the spirit of revelation as we seek to study your word. And we'll be careful. We'll be most careful 
We give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, God bless you. God bless you. Tonight, we're going to be talking about um, the one-third angelic rebellion, the uh, mistaken origin of fallen angels and demons. A long subject, but it's something I'm sure you are familiar with, something no doubt that you have heard and perhaps uh, were unaware that you had heard it. But nevertheless, it is something I have heard all my life coming up in church. We're going to talk about it tonight. The one third, you know, this is where uh, supposedly the devil sinned, rebelled against God, and he took one third of the angelic host with him. And they joined him in that rebellion. So this is what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, the one-third angelic rebellion, the mistaken origin of fallen angels and demons. Like I said, I've always heard it, and I'm pretty sure you have. I've heard it from preachers. I've heard preachers say it and preach it. I've heard by Sunday school teachers, from my Sunday school teachers, church people, even the man on the street. And they all say that prior to the fall, recorded in Genesis 3, and prior to the creation of the material world, that the devil led a rebellion in heaven. And as a result of that rebellion, he was cast out and he took with him one third of the angels who had aligned themselves with him. Now, while this notion is traditionally accepted as a biblical fact, you might be surprised to know tonight that there is not one verse in the Bible that supports it. But this traditional folklore has been adopted by the Christian church as biblical doctrine, when in fact, it is not even in the Bible. Now, how did this come about? Perhaps this idea came from a misreading and subsequently a misunderstanding and a misapplication of Revelation chapter 12, 1 through 17. I'm going to read the whole thing for you because this is where this comes from. Uh, Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 17. King James says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, dragon having seven heads and 10 horns, and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to war, for to devour, devour her child as soon as it was born. She brought forth a man child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared of God, and that they should feed her there. 1,203 score days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of that testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens 
and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants, inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. And the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth, swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, I read all of that because this is where this notion that prior to creation, there was a war in heaven. And as a result of the war in heaven, uh, Satan was cast out along with the third of the angels. This is probably because this is the only place in the Bible where it mentions a rebellion, it mentions a third, and it mentions an angel. And so they put this, traditionally this has been you know, put together uh, as the proof text, but uh, we're gonna look at it tonight. And I'm gonna show you why this one third angelic rebellion that supposedly occurred prior to creation, why it did not occur the way we think it occurred. And why this verse or this passage or this chapter, because this is the whole chapter, does not uh, project that idea. First of all, this is not a depiction of a pre human creation conflict because of these following factors. Note now, the devil could not deceive the whole world. You gotta think, because I think well, a lot of times what happens in our Bible study, we just, we just take stuff uh, by tradition, we take stuff uh, as we, you know, we've always heard it, but we, have, we don't just really read the text for ourselves. So I want you to just pause and just look at the text and think. Number one, the devil could not deceive the whole world if there was no world yet created for him to deceive. Remember, according to tradition, this supposedly happened before the creation of the world. But, you know, the angel says, you know, watch out world, the devil's come down to deceive you. Well, how can he deceive if this happened? How can he deceive the world if this happened before the creation of the world? Number two, if this was prior to the creation of humanity, then who are the brethren? <laughs> the devil was accusing day and night before God. Remember, he's a, before he was cast down, they said he was accusing the brethren day and night before God. So if this is prior to creation, there are no brethren of him to, to, to accuse. They haven't been created yet. Number three, how could they, those who were not yet created, overcome him, the devil, by the blood of the lamb when there was no blood shed by the lamb prior to their creation? This is, this is a picture of people who, who overcome the devil by the life, by, 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 by their faith in Jesus Christ. Of course, you know, at creation, the son existed, the son has always existed, but Jesus was not there. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the man Jesus. At creation, the eternal son is there, the, the, the second person of the Godhead. But the man Jesus is not because he's not, you know, he had not been born yet. 
Number four, how could they who were not yet created love not their lives to the death when, which is now prior to sin, prior to sin on earth, prior to Adam and Eve's fall in the garden, there was no death. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. The only reason death occurred was because of sin. But we're talking about a supposedly pre-creation rebellion and there was no sin among humanity. Humanity had not been created. And so it, it makes totally no sense to style this prior to creation. Because the text obviously, if you just read the details of the text, the text obviously says this happens at another time. So let's look at that obvious interpretation. Instead of being a pre creation conflict, I want to suggest to you that this is a depiction of the spiritual conflict or of a spiritual conflict that occurs prior to the birth of the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. Note the woman has a man child. The devil wants to divorce the child. Okay. Note now the woman is clothed with the sun. She has the moon under her feet and upon her head crown of 12 stars. Mm. Sounds like this woman is representative of, or a personification of, the, the 12 tribes of Israel. Such language should also uh, remind us of Joseph's dream recorded in Genesis 37 and, and 9. It says, and he, he dreamed yet another dream and told his brothers and said, behold, I dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon, you know, Jacob and Rachel, and the 11 stars, his, his 11 brothers, made obedience to me. Same symbolism. Same symbol. The woman in the story is the personification of Israel. Of course, she's Mary, but she's, she's representing Israel. The child being born is the Messiah. So this conflict, and so all this is happening, all, all, all of chapter 12 is happening at the same time. So, and then it talks about the war in heaven later on. So this is not about a pre-creation conflict. This is a conflict that occurs immediately prior to the birth of Jesus. The woman swept away, the woman is taken away, carried away. Hmm. Away from the devil. Did not Jesus, was not Mary and Joseph refugees in Egypt? Because Pilate sought to kill the child, or whoever, whoever the king was at that time, sought to kill the child. Hmm. The time and time and time I had, three and a half years, same as the, the you know, 1,260 something days. Comes out three and a half years. Sound like that a picture? That's a picture. But remember, because we we meet Jesus first. He's a babe in Bethlehem. He's born. Angel warns Joseph in a in a in a dream that they they trying they want to kill the child. He takes the child, goes to Egypt. In the meantime. The king has all of the boy babies in Bethlehem. You know, after the, the wise men come, they come and they worship the, he that was born king of the Jews. 
king is disturbed. He inquires of the wise men when, when the king should be born, when the Messiah should be born, when and where. They tell him Bethlehem of Judea. From the time they saw the star to the time they have that conversation, two years, approximately two years has transpired. Remember, shepherds come and see a baby in a, in a manger. The wise men come and see a child in the house. Two years of two years roughly have occurred. And so as a result, uh, all of the boy babies in Bethlehem, in an effort to get rid of Jesus, all of them are killed. At seven heads, 10 horns, seven crowns upon the seven heads, should remind us of Rome. It was the Romans. Okay. Conflict with Rome. So this is a picture of the physical, physical conflict between Israel and Rome. And the spiritual forces behind that conflict at the time of the birth of Jesus the Messiah. This is not about a recreation, angelic rebellion. Now, even if we look at this, this activity that was going on in the heavens, the conflict between Michael and his angel, angels and the dragon and his angels, Satan, the devil and his angels, read the text carefully. It says that the tail of the dragon drew down or cast down one third of the stars. So it does to me, it doesn't show a picture of the stars joining the devil, but look like it's a star, it's a picture of the stars being defeated or being um, engaged in conflict with the devil. They're certainly not cast out by God because the text says that the devil drew them down. So all things considered, the details of Revelation, and by the way, this is the only biblical text anywhere in the Bible that even suggests where you see angels, you see rebellion, and you see one third, all that in one place. So, so apparently uh, this, this, this um, uh, tradition comes from this text. And all I'm saying is that the timing is wrong. The details are wrong. This is not a free creation rebellion. This is something that happened during the time of the first advent of the Messiah. Okay? Details are important. Now, and then it says nothing about his origin. He's already, he's already there. He's already established. So whereas, you know, Revelation 12, 1 through 17, or chapter 12 of Revelation does not picture the origin of the devil and the angel, there are, there are some other passages that perhaps will shed some light on that aspect of the subject. In, in Ezekiel chapter 28, uh, verses 1 through 19, the prophet Ezekiel uttered a, a lamentation or a woe, a proclamation against the king of Tyrus. However, in the middle of this, he's talking to the physical king, it seems as if he reverts to the king behind the king, the spiritual king of Tyrus, who was empowering or influencing the physical king. So he's talking to the spiritual king of Tyrus as well. And of course, that is, or that was, the devil. So let's look at what that text says. That's Ezekiel, this is Ezekiel uh, chapter 28, verses 11 through 16. I'm just going to read the section uh, where he's, uh, part of the section, rather, where he's alluding 
not to the physical king of Tyrus, but to the spiritual king of Tyrus. Moreover, the Lord, the, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, take up a, a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum, remember, thou sealest up the sum uh, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou has been in Eden, of course we know the physical king was not in Eden. This is thousands of years later. So he's talking to he's talking to his spiritual, he's talking to the spiritual king of Tyrus behind the physical king. He said, Thou has been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the burl, the ox, the ox. The, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the, the carbono, carbono, carb, carbuncle, carbuncle, and gold, and the workmanship of thy trebids, and all thy pipes was prepared in the in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed carib, carib that covered, and I have set thee also, set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou had walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. Now, here's a, here's a, here's a thing that I think a lot of times we uh, tend to overlook or ignore because we, we for some reason, we we have you know well, and I'm not gonna say we. In the past, I had this impression that the angels, the spiritual beings, were sort of like robots. They were programmed to do God's will. They were gonna do God's will regardless. But apparently, everything God created, every intelligent being God created. He gave them free will. That's important. Because the angels had choices. And apparently some of them chose to rebel. This particular, this cherub here, this anointed cherub, once an angel of God, chose to rebel. Or some others join him in that rebellion. So that was perfect in all thy ways, in thy ways from the day that I was created. He was created perfect, but iniquity, iniquity was found in him. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled thee with, uh, with violence and thy sin. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. Now, the mountain of God is a reference to Eden. We're gonna talk about Eden more specifically as the dwelling place of God in just a minute. He says, I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stone of fire. So that's Ezekiel, chapter 28, verses 11 through 16. Again. He starts off talking to the physical king of Tyrus, but then he alludes to the spiritual king of Tyrus. And you have to be aware of that as you read the scripture, because there's a passage in Daniel, we alluded to it some weeks ago, when we were talking about prayer, where, where Daniel had prayed and God sent him the answer. And the angel who, who brought Daniel the, angel, the answer said that he was held up by the king of, uh, and I forget what country he, he, he represented. But my point is, it was not the physical king that held him up, but there was a spiritual principality. So apparently, as far as the king, the rulers of the world, 
there's a spiritual being that influences them. He was actually the king of that country. Uh, and, and, you know, this goes into what the Bible calls cosmic geography. We're going to touch a little bit on that in a, in, in a little bit in this section, in this uh, uh, lesson also. So, let's look at the, the angelic allusions that we see in this passage. The language in this part of the passage makes it obvious that the prophet is no longer referring to the physical king of Tyrus. The physical king of Tyrus was not perfect in beauty. The physical king of Tyrus had never been in the garden of God in Eden. He was not an anointed chair. This is, this is angelic ang uh, language he's referring to to a divine being that was upon the holy mountain of God. Same thing as Eden. Thou walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in all thy ways till iniquity was found in thee. I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. All of this language is referring to a divine or a spiritual being, not the physical king. Okay, and so most theologians, biblical scholars, attribute this language that he's talking to Satan, he's talking to the devil, he's talking to and about the devil. And so this is giving us some insight into his origin. So we so we can deduct from this. That that the devil was once an anointed cherub. He was once uh, among the angels of God. He seemed to have held a uh, a high position among the sons of God, the angels of God. And and from this we see also that there is a there is a spiritual hierarchy. You know. Among the, among the angelic beings, or among the divine beings, everybody's not on is on. Everybody's not on the same level as far as what they do, how they function. He's called the anointed cherub. He was close to God. He had, he had an elevated position. And and. Uh, Ezekiel is going to tell us later on that it's because of the elevated position that uh, his pride got the best of. So we can, he says he was in the garden. So we can connect the spiritual king of Tyrus that's depicted in Ezekiel 14. We can connect him with the serpent in Genesis chapter 3. He was in the garden. See, in ancient myth mythology, the home of divine beings and the home of God were described as gardens and mountains. Eden, as the dwelling place of the Lord God, and the other was the dwelling place, the dwelling place of the Lord God and other divine beings on earth. We missed that. And this goes in, this, this ties in to this concept that I talk about so much. You know, we're so focused on dying, going to heaven. But listen, in the beginning, it was never, it was not God's will for us to die. And so what we have in Revelation 21, we come full circle. Revelation 21 is full circle back to Genesis where we have, you know, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. We have God dwelling with man. We have God being with man. We have God, see, see it's, it, in the end, it's going to be as it was in the beginning. And in the beginning, it was God's will, not for man to go be with God, but for God to come and be with man. And so this in Eden, 
was a dwelling place of the gods. And we had access to Eden. Eden was heaven on earth. And so will New Jerusalem be heaven on earth. Now you got to understand that the snake in Genesis 3 is not just a simple snake. The ancient reader would have known and understood the author of Genesis as referring to a divine being, a cherub. In Mesopotamian tradition, there were numerous composite supernatural beings with human and animal characteristics. That's the, that's the way that they describe divine beings. He was an anointed cherub. He was the anointed cherub. Served as, as a guardian of God's throne. He served as guardian of the tree of life. Remember when Adam and Eve were cast out, the anointed cherubs were set at the gate. The interest of Eden to pre, with flaming sword to prevent them from access to the tree of life, the source of life. And then they draw, they draw the chariots of God. So um, this was the devil's or Satan's original position. This was the position from which he was cast down. Now we see a similar uh, picture uh, in Isaiah chapter 14, but where Ezekiel was addressing the king of Tyrus. Uh, Isaiah is addressing the, the spiritual king of Babylon. And he says, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, or morning star, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground? which this weaken the nation. For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, the angelic beings, the sons of God, the other divine beings. I'm going to exalt my throne above them. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north. I will ascend above the height of the clouds. I will be like the most high. I'm going to be like God. It's my aspiration. He says, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the grave, to the pit. Okay. So this is the picture of the pride factor that undoubtedly did the devil in. So by looking at the use of similar language and metaphors, such as the Mount of God, Eden, the Garden, Cherub, Shining Star, Stars of, stars of God, Stones of Fire, etc., the biblical author or the biblical authors, that is Ezekiel and Isaiah, connect and identify the divine being in Genesis 3. We got uh, uh, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Moses. They connect the divine being in Genesis 3, the serpent, with uh, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel uh, 14. They're one and the same. The arch nemesis of God, known as the devil. Thus, in connecting these three, we can deduct the origin of the devil. Check this out now. Here it is. We can, deduct, we can deduct the origin of the devil as occurring not prior to the creation of man, not a pre-creation origin, but we can deduct the origin of the devil as occurring in Eden just prior to the temptation or the temptation of Adam and Eve. Mm. 
Now, so what about his angels? We talked about the devil, but what about his angels? Now, as noted in an earlier slide, a closer look at Revelation 12 seems to indicate a third of the stars of the angels mentioned in that text did not side with the devil, but rather were cast down or maybe defeated by him. You know, his tail drags them down. They're not, they're not, the, the, the text doesn't show them collude, those stars one third colluding with him. But even if it did, you know, that's not prior to creation. That's, that's about the time of the coming of the Messiah. So what about his angels? Where did demons come? Well, in Hebrew Jewish thought, Genesis 6, 1 through 6 answers that question. Of course, if you're not familiar with that story, that's the story where the sons of God cohabitate with the children, with the uh, daughters of men. So you have divine beings, the sons of God, having sexual relations with human women, the daughters of men. Now, there have been some who have uh, who have interpreted that text. Uh, as a as a as a uh, um, a picture of of uh, you know godly men and ungodly you know women. Well, that would produce that would produce physical giants. So let's let's let the Bible say what it's saying. I mean, let, let, let the text speaks for itself. We have the sons of God, divine beings, who takes on human form, took on human form, and had sexual relations with human women. And as a consequence of that, giants were born. So let's read the text in the English Standard Version. Uh, it says, when men began to multiply on the face of the, of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, note now, it is after this occurs that God decides, I can't take no more. In 120 years, I'm just going to, Flood the earth. It was not just the sin of man that participate that precipitated the flood. The flood didn't happen just because man was so sinful. But this text gives us insight as to why man had become so sinful. It was not just the flood, it's not just man, but it was the corruption of the human race by these sons of God. Now, all of this goes back to Genesis 3.15. All this ties together. Remember, back then, after Adam and Eve sinned, God's pronouncing judgment, but he gives a glimmer of hope where he talks about the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. So this was an attempt to pollute the seed to prevent the Messiah from coming. This was, they were, they were, they were, they were trying to pollute the gene pool so that the seed of the woman would not be produced. So he says, My spirit will not abide with man forever. This is God talking for his flesh. His day shall be 120 years. The nephew were in the earth in those days and also afterward these were giants physical giants actual giants 
when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. So again, sons of God, they were divine beings, took on human form and had sexual relations with human women. That is, that is what that text is about. It's not about, it's not about the intercourse between godly men and sinful women. That's, that's not the issue. These sons of God were not men. They were not normal men. They were divine beings. They were divine beings. It was, this was an attempt to pollute the human gene pool to the extent that the seed of the woman would not come to fruition. And as a result of their union, as a result of this, this union of the sons of God, with these human women, they produce giants. And the giants are referred to in the Bible as the Nephilim. Anytime you see the Nephilim, or you see the, the referring, the referent, the, the referring, they are giants. These are physical giants. Remember uh, when they, they come into Cana, sent out the 12 spies. Ten spies says, "Hey, we were grasshoppers in that site. This, 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 this. They didn't have a low self-esteem issue. They were literally looking at giants, and these were these guys were humongous, seven to ten feet tall. Even in uh, when you see the terms the sons of the Anak, they, those were a race of giants. Goliath was one of these giants. Okay, even in the days of giant of David, they survived." Till David's time. Now, the sons of God are also known as the watchers in Jewish folklore. And uh, you can read a lot about this about, about this in, in, in the book of Enoch. And this is an extra biblical source, not in the Bible, it's an extra biblical source. But the reason why the book of Enoch is important is because many of the Jewish and Hebrew biblical writers who write in the Bible get some of their ideas and they were influenced by the book of Enoch. Particularly Peter, you see that in Second Peter and also in Jude. Because they, they're gonna specifically mention the angels that sin and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. That's mentioned in 2 Peter 2 and 4 in Jude 6. This is a reference to the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, 1 through 4, what we just read. So that's that's even further proof that this is not a simply a, a, a case about righteous men and sinful women. That's, that's not the issue at all. No, that wasn't the issue at all. Now, speaking of that, if you were to ask the average uh, Christian about the reason for sin in the world, we would we we normally talk about one rebellion, the fall in the garden. But a second century Jew, if you would ask them. They will tell you about three rebellions. Three rebellions. And these three rebellions, they say, uh, are, the, are the reason for evil in the world. Not just one, but three. So we, the rebellion number one, the one we all familiar with, when Adam and Eve see in the Garden of Eden. As a consequence, sin came into the world, and by by uh, and death by sin, and they were expelled from Eden. They lost access to communion with God because Eden was not just a place. <laughs> Eden was the holy mount of God. 
Eden was the place where God was dwelling on earth among men. And when Adam and Eve sinned, they lost access to that. They lost access to life. Remember, the tree of life is in the garden. The tree of life is going to appear again. You're not going to, not going to hear from the tree of life for a whole none of the Bible until Revelation 21, 22. We, we have made the Bible so, so, so complicated, but it's really so simple. It's quite simple. It's just a story from Genesis to Revelation. Because you see, there are only four, there are only four perfect chapters in the Bible. Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, Revelation 21 and Revelation 22. Everything in, in between after Genesis 1 and 2, from Genesis 3, all the way up to Revelation uh, 20. It's all about trying to get us back to that perfect idea. It's a circle. It's a story of a kingdom given, kingdom lost, kingdom regained. Access. Access lost, access denied, access regained. It's some story. We are the one made it complicated. Rebellion number two, what we just talked about in Genesis chapter six, when the sons of God cohabitate with humanity, as a consequence, giants were in the land. The human gene pool is polluted. And God sends the flood in an attempt to cleanse the land. Third rebellion, and that happened at, the, at, at, at Babel. They wanted to make a name for themselves. The tower they were building was not just a simple tower. It was, it was a uh, ziggurat. And in those days, those were, were buildings that in the minds of the ancients, they were designed to, to, to go into heaven, to have access to God. Ziggurats were uh, the physical representation of what I think, what I would, what, what religion. Because the religion, by definition, is man's attempt to reach God. But God, you know, God has never sponsored religion. God is not about religion. He's about relationship. And what happens to all too often, you see it over and over in the Bible, and even today, people substitute religion for relationship. And this is what they were doing at, 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 at Babel. They were trying to manipulate God. They were trying to reach God. They were trying to make a name for themselves. God says, after, after the flood, he says, to Adam, he says to Noah, rather, and his sons, multiply, scatter, spread. Same thing he said to Adam and Eve, fill the earth. Same thing he said to Adam and Eve. But instead, you read in the Bible where they said, you know, they gathered together in one place. They wanted to make a name for themselves. In direct conflict, of what God had told them to do. That's why it's called rebellion. And as a consequence, their language was confused and they were scattered and God divorced the nations. I want to read something to you uh, from Genesis, I mean, Deuteronomy 32 and 8. Deuteronomy 32 and 8, interesting passage there that I think we have not paid much attention to, not nearly as much attention as we should. Now, I'm gonna read this to you, and I'm reading it from the uh, New American Standard Bible, 
It's going to say a similar language in the uh, King James, but I want to show you something. It says, verse 8, Deuteronomy 32. This is Moses talking. He said, when the Most High gave the nation their inheritance. Listen, when the Most High, that's the time, when the Most High gave the nation their inheritance, he separated the sons of man, okay? He separated the sons of man or the sons of Adam. He set the boundaries of the people. Listen, here it is. A lot of your English Bibles say this, according to the number of the sons of Israel. Now here's the problem. He couldn't have done that. He could not at that time have separated the boundaries of the nation and separated the nation according to the sons of Israel. Why? Because at that time when he did that, there were no sons of Israel. Israel did not even exist. In fact, the next verse tells us of the creation of Israel. It says, for the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land howling waste in the wilderness, he encircled him, cared for him, he guarded him. In other words, what happened was, since the nations did not want to accept God as their leader, they rebelled at Babel, remember? God divorces the nations, says, okay, you don't want me to be your God, I let these, I let these, uh, these lesser gods, these other gods rule over you, because there are Hebrew texts, and in the Hebrew, it does not say according to the sons of Israel. It says according to the sons of God. <laughs> See, same terminology that's used in uh, Genesis 6 and 1. So it's according to the, the, the number of the divine beings. God gives the nations over to uh, be ruled by lesser beings or lesser gods. And he takes Israel and creates a nation for himself. That's the third rebellion. So the Jews will tell you, not one rebellion, three. Three. So let's look at the angels that sin because this is where we get demons. This, this is where demons come from. Now, in Second Peter, Peter talks about the angels that sin, and he's talking about these sons of God in Genesis chapter 6, verse 1, the one we just got to talking about. He says, for God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Jude talks about the same group, the same group in Jude 6. He says, and the angels which kept not their first estate, they didn't stay in their place. Instead of, instead of staying among spiritual beings, they, in, they invaded and they cohabitated with human beings. What do you mean by they left their own habitation? He, that is God, had reserved in everlasting change, uh, chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Now, listen, the angels that sinned and the angels which kept not their first estate, referring to the same group of angels, these sons of God, Genesis chapter 6. These were the sons of God who cohabitated with human women in Genesis chapter 6. Here's the interesting thing. The Greek word for hell in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, is not the commonly used word for hell, Gehenna, or Hades. He's not talking about the abode of the dead or the grave or that, or that uh uh fire pit outside of Jerusalem. He's not talking about that. There's another word used. It's the Greek word tartarus. And this is the only place in the Bible where this word is used. And it refers to a place of 
utter darkness that's even lower than Hades. In other words, he's talking about, I guess you could call it in street vernacular, South Hell. And South Hell is inhabited only by these angels that sin, these rebellious angels. Now listen, not only are they in South Hell, not only are they reserved in that place, but the Bible says they're locked up in chains. They, they, these were, this, 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 what they did was so evil, so diabolical, that God does not even allow them to have access to the earth. They are in South Hell, locked up in chains until the day of judgment. So now these, these they can't be demons because they don't have access to the earth. So where did the demons come from? The demons are their offspring. As I said earlier, according to Jewish folklore, and by the way, this is where many of the biblical authors drew many of their concepts particularly the authors of 1st and 2nd Peter and Jude, Book of Enoch, okay? Demons are consistently cast as the disembodied spirits of the dead Nephilim in their giant clad descendants or the children of Enoch. Enoch, Goliath was one of these giants. So those spirits of demons are the spirits of the dead offspring of the angels that sinned before the flood. They cohabitate. The angels that they, the sons of God came, they cohabitated with human women. They had offsprings, these giants. When these giants died, their spirits became demons, became the demons. Where the demons, this is where demons come from. Now, this conclusion makes perfect sense. Since the offspring of this union between the sons of God and human women could not have been just normal humans. It couldn't have been normal humans physically. They were giants, of course not. Nor could they be normal people spiritually. They were bastard spirits. Because they had half human spirits and half divine spirits. So they lived as giants and became demons of disembodied bastard spirits when they died. And this is where demons come from. Now, just to give you some additional reading, we're about to wrap up. Uh, this is interesting stuff. Uh, book called Legend of the Jews by, by Ginsberg. It's an old book. It's been around a long time. Uh, but the second edition is, is about 2003. Uh, Dr. Michael Heiser has done some extensive work in this, in this field. Uh, he's written three books. I highly recommend them to you. Uh, Demons, what the Bible really says about the power of darkness. That's from 2020. Uh, the Unseen Realm. Recovering the Supernatural Worldview of the Bible, that's from 2015. Uh, now, there's a, there's a book called Supernatural that he wrote that, that has the same material as the, the Unseen Realm, but it's in uh, simpler language. It's not, a science, it's not an academic book, so I would recommend that to you if, you're not, if you don't want to get bogged down. Uh, Reversing Herman is his latest work. Uh, it talks about the watchers and the forgotten mission of Jesus Christ, how Jesus came to, to undo and confront the work of the watchers. And of course, uh, there's a book called The Dictionary of Deities and Demons in the Bible uh, by uh, Riley. It's edited by several people. That's uh, copyright 1999. Well, I hope, this, I hope this study has been interesting for you. 
And uh, I didn't go into a whole lot of detail. Just wanted to whet your appetite and hope you do some more study and some deeper study. But this this study was just an example of how how simply reading the Bible on its own terms uh, would debunk many of the common traditional beliefs that are plainly contrary to what the Bible actually says and teaches. And I did one the other week, you know, about you know you know you commonly hear people say God won't put no more on you than you can bear. That's not in the Bible. God doesn't put stuff on us. The Bible doesn't, that's not in the Bible. The Bible doesn't say that. But that comes about by people just not, not letting the Bible speak for itself, putting their own spin, their own putting words in God's mouth, so to speak. So it's my hope and prayer that this study will stimulate all who view it and interact with it uh, to graduate from just casual or occasional Bible readers. Listen, it's an exciting book, guys. Uh, but I hope you just graduate from kindergarten Bible readers and become serious and studious students of the Bible. Because our faith, our spiritual growth, even our spiritual life depends on a correct understanding and interpretation of the biblical text. The Bible says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Listen, guys, this book called the Bible is essential to your physical and your spiritual well-being. And you need to learn how to read it for yourself within the context in which it was written so that you might get the true message it's seeking to convey to you. So do your best to present yourself to God as one Approve the worker. You need not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the words of truth. Well, God bless you, my friend. I hope uh, and pray that uh, this video, this lesson tonight, has uh, been some value to you, will help you in your walk with the Lord as we seek to impart knowledge uh, that will help you to grow knowledge that will help you to be more accurate in your walk with the Lord and in your representation of the Lord. Well, God bless you. Uh, as I say all the time, if this video has been a blessing to you, it will be a blessing to someone else. So I encourage you, we encourage you to share it on your timeline uh, and share it with uh, your friends. You can find this video on our uh, church Facebook page. I also share it to my personal uh, Facebook page, and you can find it on my personal YouTube page. Well, God bless you, and I pray and hope until next time that God will bless you in a great way. Until next time, may the Lord bless you real good is our prayer.